Apple as a social network. Wow. Thank you all for coming in such a big number. And I see many new faces, probably because we are spreading between the clouds from many AWS talks to uh, GCP talks. So welcome. Uh, so today, so how we run these meetups? We normally start around 6 with pizzas and drinks. Uh, uh, you mingle a little bit, then we start the presentation uh, around 6.30. I do the introduction about the community, what's news. Then we have featured talks. We have two community members, uh, Kudz and Matt, here. They're going to be teaching us Google Cloud Functions and the Firebase tonight. And then at the end, we have at least half an hour to an hour of networking. So that's kind of the, the part that people like the most. And I hope to see you again next time, even if the topic may not be uh, GCP related because serverless is the same religion. We don't choose which religion we were born in, but like uh, it spreads across the clouds, and it's more about the mindset uh, than 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 the uh, functions themselves. So I, I wanted to to start with this intro about serverless. Uh, like uh, our meetups, if you were following, like last uh, it's second year now, we are all over the place. We started as a, a function as a service. But uh, before you know it, we started uh, integrating other people's APIs and managed services. And then we also have a startup companies uh, that are visiting us and talking about the funding for startups, plus uh, some AI talks. And then we also friendly with UX guys. We had uh, uh, people from Smashing Conf coming. So we are kind of building bridges between the two. So, so this, this mystical logo came uh, from the uh, Lean Product uh, Playbook and, and the Agile uh, group uh, from California. Uh, uh, by Dan Olson, and, and really in, in, we are about agile, achieving agility, but not through the traditional scrum way of sprinting fast, uh, but kind of uh, having bigger building blocks and, and, and less ops with serverless. So, so that's what this group is about. That's why we, we have tops uh, from all, all clouds and, and all aspects. And, and then we wouldn't be here if it was not for, for the sponsors. Uh, so we are lucky. Uh, that a Manning Publishing Company is uh, giving us uh, one book a month. I think they made a mistake. They're giving us 14 books this month. So, so we'll, uh, whatever's left over, we'll give in December for the last meetup. Those titles that are not crossed, uh, they're available to you. I think I have two coupon codes for the number one. So I have to double check if you like the number one book, you can, you can uh, uh, get it. Why I like Manning, it's a real-time learning. They call it Manning Early Access Program. So it's like a beta forum where people are writing the books in real time. You can talk to the authors, learn from them, and contribute to the book itself. And, and, and that's how I really, like through this first book, I became friends with the authors of the book and, and prepared some of the talks. The book I was reading on the plane last week is this one. It's a beautiful book. And, and we had the ML and AI talk last, uh, last month, and people were wondering what it has to do with serverless. But not everything is about data models and, and, and this data science. You can start from the top down using application level services. So if I were you, this is a brand new book. I would kind of look at this one. It is AWS biased. We don't have it right now. I will ask Manning to give us for the next year. But they always have discounts. So, so just sign up for the uh, email list, and you can get, get what we are uh, giving now for free for 40% off most of the time if you're a member on their list. So that's the first sponsor I need to thank. And most of the things I know, I learned through their books and video courses. And then, and then again, like I call this place a serverless church. Like they are almost every meetup, uh, they allow us to be here. And maybe Shanley can come and, and say a few words about uh, my planet. So for, with me, like so, my personal as an outsider view, like I, I knew I we liked them, but we couldn't explain that. And it wasn't about the glass door, uh, glass door reviews. It wasn't about the common interest in content management software that we uh, grew over the decades. But there is something about this B corporation uh, that uh, Shanley will tell you more about, about uh, working for the interest of e everyone, not just uh, shareholders. So please, please tell, say a few words. Sure. Hi, I work at MyPlanet. Uh, we are a software studio that builds smarter interfaces. We're also a B Corp. We strive for and actually are audited and certified to be uh, a company that works for all the stakeholders for our projects. And indeed, uh, we try to balance that with a wide array of public as well. So if you're interested in working with new uh, UIs and novel ways of working, serverless, and really polishing the user experience, uh, please come talk to me afterwards. 
Thank you so much. So, so, uh, and also uh, we have uh, a catering sponsor. The pizza is a joy. These compliments of Ivan. Ivan, uh, please tell us a few words about Divinity. He was a sponsor last time as well. I was almost embarrassed uh, to accept uh, uh, his sponsor. Hey, Daniel, you organize all of this. I just paid for the pizza, so I think I got a really good deal. <laughs> So anyways, I'm not going to keep your attention too long. I'm just going to say a few things. Divinity is actually not religious. It's developers infinity, shortened, which means the work is actually never done. It uh, started as a community of freelancers, kind of grew into a company because we wanted to build stuff and we needed more and more people and we needed some, a way of charging clients. So we had to make a company, right? Most of us are remote, global, I think, 30% of the company, I don't even know where they are at the moment, but they respond on emails and on they show up for conference meetings, so I'm fine with that. I drew, I drew the short straw of having to be the CEO, or as I call it, the uh, bad things shoveler. So anyways, what do we do? Whoops. We don't know how to use the PowerPoint presentation, but okay. So uh, we solve a problem that every startup has. Uh, every startup needs a technical co-founder, right? and it's hard to find one, why? So why does a startup need it? Technical leadership, software engineering experience, and development, right? You need to build tech product if you're a startup. Uh, the flaws of that, single point of failure, a guy gets annoyed, he leaves, you don't know what your tech does, does it exist, does it work, what stage is it in, and so forth. Good engineers cost a lot of money, and personal attachments. Some guy might like Node.js, some guy might like Java, some guy might even like Lua, for bit's sake. But you need to make the business decision which tech is gonna serve your business purposes the best. So what do we do? We basically act as a tech partner by building out your tech. Why us? We eat our own dog food. Most of us are failed startup founders. Failed as in we were good at building stuff, we were terrible at selling it. We just don't know how to sell it, but we know how to build it. Like I said, technical founders, we grew from a community, so we, even though we don't have a large number of employees, we're less than 30 people now, I think. And we have a very large community, over 500 engineers, tech people, designers, whatever. And like I said, laser focused, no BS, no buzz, no hype, just straightforward, real tech value. That's it, I'm gonna keep you Thank you. I need a clicker. So, so, so now, now we normally do kind of introductions. So t you, you say why you came here, or what interests you, and you can do pitch of any, any kind, really. You have ten, sec ten seconds. So, ping me on LinkedIn, and I'll send you your coupon code. So, so that's almost uh, it for the intro. Uh, so just to tell you what's coming, uh, like after uh, in the in so these are the feature talks we're going to have soon. But we have already scheduled uh, meetups for the for the end, and uh, until the end of the year. So as we mentioned in September, we're going to have a serverless design and best pa uh, uh, practices. Uh, that's uh, Amazon uh, Solutions Architect. That is a charge of startup. So if you have a startup have questions unrelated to what he's talking about, he can help you. He's a tech masters coach as well. Just giving you heads up. So. If you're in startup space, come come this meetup regardless of the topic. Then in October, uh, Jay already announced he's going to be talking about CI/CD pipeline. And then Nove November, December, so reInvent this year at Amazon is a beginning of December, and I'm tracking to to get those authors of that first book that Manning is giving to talk to us. So they're not sure they're going to come before reInvent or after reInvent, but they're going to be here. And then, uh, like, uh, um, because after these big conferences, there is always recap what happened. And, and I was lucky that last month there was a, a senior guy uh, from Amazon who says he's going to do that anyway. So I just added his name. So it's going to be cool. Like That's his job to uh, educate uh, people. So that's what's happening in the future. Thank you for coming. I hope to see you again regardless of the topics because serverless is the same religion we believe in. It's a mindset. It's just doing more with less. And now our feature presenters. Matt, start first. Is this, this one on? Hi, I'll just say hi. I missed the mic on the way back. I'm John. I'm a freelance solutions architect and developer. I'm a co-organizer of the event with Daniel. Sorry, um, John. And I'm excited that we have Google content tonight because, what are we, 18 months old or so, and we've yeah. had a pretty heavy bias towards AWS, self-admitted bias. I mean, I'm an AWS practitioner, as is Daniel. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing some uh, 
speakers on the Google content and the Firebase. But this was accidental. We, we just didn't know other clouds, but we know like how good things we can learn from Google. And I'm so excited to have speakers. They're going to teach us something about Firebase. Give us a few minutes, we're switching screens because there's gonna be live demo. So normally, if you present from their computer, it's just a kind of slide demo, but uh, Matt and Kudz are brave enough to do the live demos and, and we try, so we're gonna connect their laptops to the recording uh, screen so you can get it afterwards to go through that. And uh, they're all go also gonna share the code so you can uh, go with the exercises at home on your own. And thank you again. All right, can everybody uh, hear me clearly at the back? Awesome. So uh, I'm just gonna start by introducing myself briefly and not with that slide. Okay, so my name's Matt. I started coming to this meetup in December. Uh, it's not a very complicated story. Basically, I ran into serverless framework and I uh, decided to run a few commands from their tutorial and see if it worked, and it worked. And I was like, oh my God, I don't have to actually set up servers anymore. So that was kind of exciting. And then I was like, I wonder if there's a meetup on that website, and then there was. So I came and it was pretty good, so I'm gonna stick around. And then Daniel uh, found out that I work, uh, sorry, I work at a company that uses Google Cloud. And so he asked if I wanted to present about that. And so that's what I'm gonna be doing. I'm gonna be giving an introduction to what is in my opinion the simplest serverless technology that Google Cloud has. And they call it Google Cloud Functions. And we're gonna be looking at the web console a little bit, but we're mostly gonna be using their command line tool to, to do the deploys. So you should also learn how you can use it to automate your workflows and maybe set up some CI CD with it. So what exactly is Google Cloud Functions? It basically takes a function that you write, which is in a few different languages, either Node, Python, or Go, and you just run a command and it uploads it to Google Cloud and then you get a URL that you can put in your browser and that's your server code running. It's really similar to AWS Lambda, if anybody has used that here. Uh, later in my presentation, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what the differences and similarities are between them. So the main thing people do with it is they put together little HTTP APIs with their HTTP trigger or they use the pub sub trigger, which means that if they do an observer pattern or a pub sub system, they can have a function react to something. For example, a file being uploaded to a storage bucket, and then they can do something with that file. There's also some Firebase events that can be used as triggers, which the next presenter will talk to you a bit about too. And thing, something to keep in mind is it's stateless. So whatever you do in your function, don't write things to disk because they're not gonna be there when the server shuts down. They can scale down to zero when, the, when nothing is running, which is good because it saves you money. You're not paying for anything. And they can scale up infinitely, uh, depends how many servers Google Cloud happens to have running in their data centers, as the traffic comes in. So the more HTTP requests or the more messages that come in, the more it's gonna scale up automatically for you. And you're only charged for every 100 milliseconds of your code running. So I'm gonna show you two ways of interacting with it. You can use the web console, which looks like the top screenshot. And uh, a nice thing about that is you can browse it and explore their marketplace, which lets you deploy apps that are kind of pre-configured. Or if you're familiar with command line, you can use the G Cloud tool. So without further ado, let's make something. So this is the solution. I'm just gonna delete it because we're gonna make it from scratch. And for this uh, demo, we're actually gonna start with a few conditions. So just to make it clear, if you wanna do this at home, you need to have the G Cloud tool installed. You can see how I've already got that installed on my machine. And before we actually use that tool, we do need to go to the uh, GCP console because we're gonna create a project. That's Google Cloud's way of organizing your code. Things that you deploy will be in the Oh, sure, thank you. Sorry. Uh, I'm sorry? That's a very good point. So um, I'll try to do that as quickly as I can. <laughs> I'm gonna increase my font size. How's that? 
Nice. Okay. I'm very happy that you said that now. Okay. So uh, we're going to create a project. And so I can call this project whatever I want. I'm going to call it serverless Toronto August 12th. So that doesn't clash with anything else I have. And it's going to go ahead and create that for us. And what we need to do is find out what its uh, ID is, because we're going to use that to configure our command line tool. So we should see that in a moment. In this case, the ID is the same name as the project, because uh, nobody else in the world created a project with this name. So to do that, to configure the tool, we run this command. gcloud uh, config set project. And then I can just type in serverless Toronto August 12th. And now we're ready to upload functions. Notice how I didn't have to uh, configure any files to store keys here right now. So the command that we're going to run to deploy our function is this. We'll run that in a moment. The first thing I'm going to do is create my index.js file. I don't need to create an NPM package. Uh, I don't need to use any frameworks right now. We're going to be doing this with no frameworks. So all I have to do is just say module.exports.hello world equals function. So as I write this, I want to ask, does anybody find what I just wrote to look familiar to them? Raise your hand if it looks familiar. I see quite a few hands. Does it, has everybody heard of the Express framework? So under the hood, Google Cloud is using Express to power their Node.js functions. And there's no need to go through an API gateway to configure to map the data. In this case, they give you a request and response object with the same API as Express Framework. So in order to send a response, I can type in res send. So now we're ready to deploy. I need to do that uh, first before anything else, because it is going to take about two minutes. Uh, this is the command. We have our runtime configured to be Node.js 10. And I do need to say, what is the name of the function that we've exported? So it's going to look in index.js. And that's going to be the function that it deploys. It's asking me if I want to enable Google Cloud Functions, because this is the first time I've ever done it with this project. And so that's going to take about a minute, and then it's going to automatically deploy it. In the meantime, while it's deploying, I'm going to start the next step here. So we're going to be doing a web page, which will contact this function. So we're creating a file called index.html. And I'm going to take some boilerplate here and paste it in. Uh, I'm just going to zoom out to quickly show you that this is a very small web page. And I'll zoom back in now so people at the back can see. Uh, I'm bringing in jQuery, and it's got a span where I'm going to put the data after it's retrieved from the API. And then there's a get request to the API. But that's all this web page is. To get the page running, I can use npm to install a package called HTTP server globally. And when this is finished, I can run HTTP server in the page directory. And it will serve whatever's in my directory. So now when I go to Chrome, I've got a web server running. It's a very handy tool for development. So the web page is localhost 8080. And in this case, it didn't work because I forgot to save. So I've saved and refreshed. And there it is, loading. So our function hopefully has finished deploying now. It has not. So I will talk about DevTools. We're going to be using DevTools to uh, examine what happens here. Because what I'm doing is I'm actually setting us up for failure. We're going to have cores errors, and I'm going to show you how to fix them with no library. Because cores is actually a lot simpler than many people think. All right, Google, how's the function doing? Yeah, it didn't take this long when I did the first uh, run through. And I got an error because I did the command in the wrong directory. So I'm going to do the command in the correct directory this time. And this should only take a little bit longer to deploy. So um, I'm just going to mention, by the way, if you have any questions with what I'm doing so far, 
like you can't see, let me know because I can zoom in and stuff. But if you have questions about how this works, we are going to do Q&A after. I can take a few minutes to explain more about you know, Google, Google Cloud Functions and uh, you know, how it might be different or similar to AWS and stuff like that. A similarity with AWS is that they both take a very long time to deploy. <laughs> and it's deployed, so I'm very happy about that. Let's uh, no, notice how it has our URL provisioned for us. And for those of you who are familiar with um, HTTPS, TLS certificates, you'll be really happy to see that it has provisioned a certificate for us on Google's domain. So you don't have to worry about that if you want to use this as is in your apps. And you can see the hello world here which proves that it worked. So if uh, all I have to do now is take that URL and put that in my Ajax code as the hello world URL. And then when I refresh the web page, it should work. And it should replace loading with a message. And in this case, the request failed. If I look in the console, we see this. No uh, access control allow origin header. Raise your hand if you've seen this error before. <laughs> Pretty much everybody again. Okay, doesn't surprise me. I took me years to understand how to fix these issues. So we're gonna do that now. And uh, because deploying takes so long, what I'm gonna do is uh, take a snippet that I have prepared. I'm gonna add that to my function. I'm gonna put it right above res send, and we're gonna do the deploy again. Same command. While that deploys, I'd like to uh, take a minute to talk about what exactly I've done. <coughs> so when you do a request from a, the browser to a server, what happens is the browser is on a domain or a URL like uh, meetup.com, something like that. And then the server could be on a different domain. And so if they're on the same domain and the same port and everything like that, and the HTTPS has to match too, the browser will be allowed to use the response. And in this case, our website is on localhost. Might be hard to read, but it's localhost 8080 at the top there. And the server is uh, Google Cloud Functions.net or something like that, right? So all you have to do to allow the browser to have access to that response is add a header called Access Control Allow Origin. And you say what origins are allowed to read the response. For us, that's just HTTP localhost 8080. So to, uh, to avoid a really flexible course policy that makes our API completely open, I'm only putting the origin that we have on that whitelist. So once the function finishes deploying, which it has, I can refresh my web page, and it should work. Hello world. No cores error. So let's set, us up, let's set ourselves up for some more failure. Let's try to do the next thing somebody might try to do with an SPA, which is send a post request. So I have a snippet um, in my web page. Right, right now we only have that get request, but I have a snippet for doing a post request as well. It's for a uh, typical to-do app where we're gonna be posting a to-do, and I can put that here. To make things clearer, instead of uh, using, instead of replacing a DOM element with the contents of the response, I'm gonna do an alert for this one. That way we can tell the difference between the two. And I'm gonna deploy another function for this. So we can do this one from scratch too. It's not too complicated. This one's gonna be create to-do. It's still you know, request response. I'll leave that header in there, except this time I'm going to send a JSON response from Express. And this is typical of some APIs. You might say that something was created, like the to-do. So we're gonna use whatever was sent as a JSON request body as our to-do, and we're gonna just return that from the server. And to deploy that, I use the same command, except I say that we're deploying create to-do. and I'm gonna get that running. So
So when that's finished deploying, we're going to replace that URL in the web page, and then we're going to see whether or not the course will work. Spoiler alert, it, it probably won't. Hopefully this one doesn't take too much longer to deploy. If you're curious what's happening, by the way, um, how it deploys is it takes your code and it sends it directly to Google's server. And there's, there's no need for an intermediary step, like uploading it to a bucket. It, so in this case, the G Cloud tool can just do this all for you. Uh, we'll address questions at the very end. And here's our URL. Uh, you'll notice it's actually the same thing, uh, except the very end says create to do. So I'm going to reuse this URL here. I'm going to go into my web page and replace the URL and just change the hello world here to create to do. And I think I also need to actually say what I'm sending. So in this case, I'm going to say that uh, in this to do, uh, my title of it is going to be to answer AWS questions at the end. And then uh, I can refresh the web page, and this should send our to-do. All right, here's another core zero. So this is actually slightly different. Uh, notice that this one is not talking about the cro uh, access control allow origin header being missing. This one is asking about, uh, this one's telling us about an issue with pre-flight request. So to explain what exactly is happening here, this is a little bit more complicated than the first one, but it's, it's not too bad. So th what we're sending is a JSON request, and these are new. The internet before didn't really have these. So when they brought cores or to, to the industry, they said that an options preflight is required for this type of request. That's why we need to do this here, but we didn't have to do it for the old one. And the options preflight asks the server, what, are this, what is the allowed origin, what's the allowed method, what's the allowed headers? And I say, only that origin, only posts, and only the content type, because it's a JSON request. And then the browser receives that options response, and it now knows what it's allowed to do next. And it now knows that it's allowed to send the uh, post request. And so to make this work, I have another uh, snippet here. And I can go back to my create to do function and insert that. And same idea here, we're going to get this deploying as soon as I can. So notice how I didn't need to bring a cores library into this. And that's because, uh, this is my opinion, don't take it for gospel, but libraries can be a bit overrated. Sometimes you don't need them to address certain problems. And in this case, uh, because Google Functions gives you that raw express request object, I wanted to show you how all you have to do is look for which method it is in this case. And if it's options, handle it early. And set those three headers. That's the three headers for allowing origin, methods, and headers. And then if it's not an options request, it, it has to be a post request. And so we're gonna just, we're, then we just do everything as, as usual, where we say which origin is allowed to read that response, and then we give it that JSON response. So in theory, once this is finished deploying, this should fix the issue. We'll get this ready. All we'll have to do is refresh to see. And it's deployed. So now we refresh. And it worked. No more course errors. In this case, the response from the server is that we have a create an object with created property, and there's our to-do that was created. And notice, too, something interesting that I think is unique to Google Cloud compared to some other tech is it parsed the body for us. So there was no need to configure an API gateway layer ahead of time to know what data was coming in. It's just the request. And they're, they're looking at the content type to figure out how to parse that for you. So that actually concludes the demo portion of fixing those cores errors and getting it deployed. To finish off, uh, let's talk more about the other popular option, AWS Lambda. Uh, in my opinion, there's more similarities than differences. Uh, they both have that same feature where they scale down to zero so that you're not charged when they're not in use. And they both charge you per 100 milliseconds. They both have a little bit of a weird programming model where because it's a container that gets shut down, you got to be careful about some things that you might do, like creating an SQL connection, because you're going to get an SQL connection for every concurrent request that comes in. 
because only one container handles one request at a time. And they both, they both support a variety of events, HTTP and PubSub and stuff like that. AWS has a bit of an edge when it comes to languages. GCP only supports three right now. And AWS lets you even add custom runtimes, which allows you to use pretty much every programming language you can think of, I think. Don't quote me on, my, on that. <laughs> and uh, they both allow long running tasks, which makes them really useful for stuff like background processing. And uh, the edge, in my opinion, kind of goes on GCP here because with AWS, if you want to have an event that reacts to an HTTP trigger, it has to finish in 30 seconds. With GCP, it can run up to nine minutes, whether it's an HTTP response or handling a pub sub event. So here's where things get very different though. With AWS, you often need to use frameworks to address some of the complexity. And I think a lot of that complexity is API Gateway. And I'm not knocking API Gateway because I think it has a lot that it can do for you. But you have to configure it, right? And so if you want to play around with serverless, just the very first thing you do, you're going to have to think about what API Gateway is and make sure that maybe serverless framework is configuring it right. And then your request goes from Gateway to your function and gets returned. With Google, you'll notice that we didn't even have to think about that middle layer. So there is an API gateway because as the word serverless means, there's still servers somewhere under the hood. They still have to have some sort of gateway, but they configure it for you. And that may be an advantage because it's simple, but you may have to think carefully about that because you may want to do certain configuration to support features or to parse your request in certain ways. Because all they do is they look at content type to figure out what to do. If it's a JSON request, they'll parse it into a JSON object. If it's uh, binary data, they'll create it, they'll convert it to a buffer so that you can deal with the binary data. And so from a developer's perspective, as you saw today, all we really had was the browser and the Google Cloud function. So that's why, that's where I think there's the most difference there. All right, and that concludes the uh, presentation in demo. If you liked what I presented and you want to see more things that I try to do in my spare time, like using serverless tech, I recommend subscribing to my blog because when I have time, I like to post on there. And so I can post things that I do. Thanks. So um, before uh, moving on to the next presenter, uh, does anybody have any questions? Ooh, okay. got lots. So first hand I saw. Can we pass the mic around? Is that best? Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a question regarding the deployment. Sure. Um, I usually use a serverless framework mm -hmm. when I need to deploy to different environments. How does it work with GCP, for instance? So like sorry, did you say routing? Like, uh, yeah, every other, everything that's related to infrastructure, let's say a uh, network, um, sub okay. networks, security groups, you know, uh, RDS, I mean, database and all those things kind of things. Sure, uh, so just to repeat the question was, how does networking and security groups work with Google Cloud Functions, correct? Yeah, if we have to compare, if I have to deploy the whole infrastructure because with serverless framework, that's something that I can do, right? Yes, so uh, sir, so something to keep I in mean, mind. I mean, at least I can define the security groups, uh, IDs and all those things. Okay, I think I, I understand. So um, with serverless framework, what it's really doing is uh, converting your uh, YAML file to what the cloud provider needs to finish a deployment. With AWS, that's CloudFormation. With Google Cloud, that's uh, something else. I actually forget what they call it, to be honest. And so in order to do security groups like that, uh, serverless framework needs to be aware of the Google equivalent of what I think um, AWS calls security groups, which is a service account. And I don't know exactly how serverless framework does that, but uh, I, I know for a fact that they could support it. And um, when you're deploying functions like I did in my demo, you do have the ability to associate a individual service account with each function. What we deployed did not specify that, right? What we got today was a default and it has every permission. That function that I deployed could delete database things, delete files, whatever it wanted to. So it is good practice to, to apply that. And then you also said networking. So AWS and Google Cloud both support what are called VPCs, uh, virtual private something. and some, sorry? Yeah, that's the, right. And so, right, I'm actually not too strong on networking myself, but I've looked into this a lot lately because I want to learn how it works, right? And um, the idea is that you can, uh, you can keep your uh, cloud resources tight together 
uh, security-wise, where your cloud function can, can access things but nothing else can, for example. Both AWS and Google Cloud support that. Uh, they, they just support it in general. I would actually have to double check, though, to know whether Google Cloud functions can be, as, can be part of a VPC. I think that this is where Google is a little bit behind, and they need to, they might not have that yet, and they need to work on that. Okay. No problem. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, I have two questions. The first one is, how would you pre-warm uh, uh, Google Cloud functions or the containers there? And the second one is, without an API gateway, it takes away things like throttling and security. Uh, directly exposing the URL for Google Cloud Functions, how do you secure that as well? Okay, so the question was, how do you deal with uh, the features that API Gateway gives you, like throttling yeah. and making sure, uh, sorry, what was the first part? The first one is how do you pre-warm your- Pre-warming, yes. okay, so uh, Lambda and Google Cloud both have the same concept of pre-warming, where your container is gonna be not running until a request comes in. So if you want to uh, have the container able to respond right away, you need to do something that's gonna trigger it. So you just create your own background task to, to do something. If it's a pub sub function, just send a message through pub sub every uh, one or two minutes, whatever you're comfortable with paying for. And uh, if it's HTTP, set up something that's gonna send a request to it, right? This is something that's kind of a serverless anti-pattern. Not that, it, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but it means that you have to think about your solution because it's not, they're not gonna tell you in the docs how to keep a function pre-warm. Uh, there's other features that Google Cloud is coming out with soon though that are uh, designed to be more like traditional HTTP apps. So I keep an eye on what they're doing because you might actually solve the pre-warming problem a bit. All right, so you had a question, sorry. Sorry? Oh, oh, right. Um, so that's a huge concern. In fact, in my opinion, that's where AWS has a huge edge because you just simply cannot throttle your functions per function with Google Cloud, at least from what I've played around with so far. They support, they've identified it as a problem though, so you can set like a limit on your project where uh, you, you can set like a concurrent function execution limit across all of the functions that you have in your project. It might help a little bit. Um, otherwise, you're gonna have to do your own throttling. In the f so in VS Code here, what I could do is I could say, um, I could, could program my own logic connected to some sort of tracking system to track how many requests have come in per IP address and then you know throttle like that. So the short answer is you're on your own to, to implement those yourself. So the same concept. So API Gateway has, fe in, in AWS, API Gateway has features that can take a token and do something with it. Google Cloud, you're gonna have to create token handling logic right here, yourself. Yeah. Using, for example, uh, a JIT library, or JOT, however it's pronounced, and uh, like a JSON web token. And you, you'd have to work with that yourself. So this is uh, definitely, if, if you're creating complex things like that, I would, suggest maybe using something that has a uh, API gateway features. Oh, right, uh, yeah, so both clouds have um, ways of having a secret put into the function at runtime. Not my area of expertise, unfortunately. Never played around with it, because so, I do mostly uh, public things with this when I use it at work. So unfortunately, I'm not the best person to answer that. So a uh, question, when using serverless uh, with AWS, one of the really neat function is you can define the infrastructure in the serverless file. Yep. I can define queues, SNS, fanouts, security groups, everything basically, well, almost everything. Uh, does uh, GCP support something like that or? Uh, yeah, I mean, from, from what I've explored, there's tools like Terraform where you declare your infrastructure as code and then run a deploy command and everything is done. Uh, and then there's also a serverless framework, which I think has its place. When you have a complex system with infrastructure tied to a function, like a DynamoDB table or something like that, it's helpful to have the serverless YAML right next to your serverless function. And so, uh, you know, that's where I would, at that point, install serverless framework and, and set it up that way. And this is an area that I haven't spent too much time in, but it would, be, it would actually come down to whether or not they've added stuff like that to the GCP equivalent. Uh, to the GCP uh, reference here. So you'd have to check out their documentation and, and see, you know, can you have a service account defined as YAML? Can you do this as YAML and that? Right. Thank you. Sure. So I'm thinking like it's 720 that we do another presentation and we can combine Q&A at the end, like unless you object that. What yep. do you think? I'm gonna stick with? around so and then both uh, we of can them do more Q&A. You can address everybody and then we can transition into mingling and networking. So, is that okay? Okay. So. Hmm?
Thank you. So Kutz is next. Thank you, Matt. So I want to see you guys on the stage here as well. Matt joined us months ago, and, and we worked on this, and Kutz as well. So plan what you want to share with the rest of us. Everybody has a way to contribute. So. So let's just set up the recording on the on the other laptop. Uh, that's where he's one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And we're good. All right. Cool. And uh, is this okay? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hi guys. Uh, my name is Kutz. Uh, I'm from St. Catharines, uh, it's my first time here, so I'm really glad to, uh, to join you guys. Uh, I'm gonna be presenting about Firebase and how uh, it can be paired with uh, serverless. Uh, a little bit about myself, my background is in business. I've only just started transitioning into software about a year and a half ago. I am looking to go fully into software, but I am still working in marketing. Uh, what forced me to come to start doing software was because I was trying to build a music application and I had trouble uh, getting a developer, because I was still in school back then, who could help me build it. So I just said, you know what, let me learn how to code and I'll build it myself. And um, that was a problem on its own because I needed somewhere to store the music, I needed somewhere to serve the application from, and uh, I was taught that you needed a server to do all these kind of things. But I quickly found out about Firebase, and uh, it really uh, helped me to get everything up and running extremely fast. Uh, I would say Firebase is more of a high-level tool of Google Cloud, and uh, Google Cloud is a, is, is a very low level for people who want to have more control on uh, their tools. So to start off with, I'm just going to talk about the different tools that Firebase offers. It, it does have up to 20 features, but I'm just gonna talk about four of them. The first one is real-time databases. Uh, real-time databases are no SQL cloud-hosted database. Uh, your information is in JSON, and each node is actually, can be accessed from, the, from a URL route. I'll do a quick uh, console demonstration of that later. Uh, all your clients and applications that access that database are on, uh, are all in one database instance. So if there's a change on that database, everyone receives that update, as long as they're connected online. And if they, are, if they go offline, the minute they come back online, they receive those new updates. Um, it can scale up to 100,000 concurrent uh, connections. Um, yeah. Another feature is the web hosting platform that they offer. Very easy to use. Um, they have a CLI that you can work with to deploy your applications. It also comes with SSL built into it so your websites are secure. Uh, this can also be paired with uh, cloud functions. I'll talk about that part later. And uh, the Firebase uh, hosting tool also comes with uh, versioning. So each time you make a deployment, it's actually keeping track of the versions so you can always do a simple click to go back to the last version. So that's, that's pretty helpful. Uh, on the website, they say it supports static websites, but these days everyone's using single page apps like React, Angular, and Vue. These are dynamic applications and they can be deployed onto Firebase. So it's production ready. Uh, another tool is uh, Firebase Storage. This one is actually built on top of Google Cloud Storage. You don't have to go through the Google Cloud uh, console. They have their own console that you can work with. It's very easy to upload files. It's very easy to download. You can upload the files using the console, or there's an API that you can work with. You send, you send it the objects that you want. Uh, it's built on the same infrastructure as Spotify and uh, Google Photos, so it's, pretty, it's a pretty big application. Um, and then, yeah, finally, the Firebase Cloud Functions, they, uh, as, you s as Matt showed, they basically allow you to run uh, backend code and, uh, 
upon uh, receiving events. Uh, it is, the difference is on Firebase, you can only run JavaScript and TypeScript. I'm not sure if they're gonna introduce more languages in the future, but currently it's Node.js and TypeScript. Um, okay, I'll just do a little quick console overview. So this is your dashboard. It's a pretty, it's a, I've already created a project. I'm not gonna try set that up just in case the internet is slow. So to the left here, you have the different applications. You have your authentication. Uh, if you wanna handle user sign up, user registration. Uh, they do support uh, all the different uh, sign in methods. If you wanna have people sign in using Facebook, uh, Google, you have documentation of how you can do this. There's the databases here, Cloud Firestore and re real-time databases. Cloud Firestore is a transactional database. It's like MongoDB. So if you're familiar with that, they're really trying to push this Cloud Firestore of late. And this is the real-time database. As you can see, it's a JSON structure. You can actually click into the different nodes. And if you noticed, the URL actually changes, so you can actually access your database uh, directly from the URL in your Node.js applications or any other applications, and you get back uh, your data as JSON, as a big JSON tree. And you can actually create uh, uh, new routes by simply typing in the name of the node that you are, but I'm not gonna do that right now, because uh, we're gonna need this later. I'll just go back to uh, the presentation. Yeah, so uh, that's what it'll look like when it's pre, as it pre-populates. You can see it has this uh, weird looking string of characters here. That is actually a unique ID. It actually has, this data is actually uh, sorted in order. So that ID has your timestamp and everything that you need to order them, to order it. Uh, so instead of you having to create your own uh, IDs, Google automatically creates those IDs for you. Um, this is what the, this is the functions. As you can see right there, these are the different functions that I've deployed. It tells you uh, how you can access that function. There's a little URL over here. I've kind of figured that, and it tells you the the environment that you've deployed it in, the memory that it's using, and the timeout. That's how long it's gonna run before it cuts out. I believe the cutout for this is nine minutes. Um, you can increase this within your function. Uh, continue. There's also your console log. If you wanna, I think this is, I've tried using AWS for testing and logging stuff to a console is a little bit difficult. I think this console is very simple. Anytime you can log something, you can see it over here. And you can also search for different logs that you want. So I'm gonna talk about how the real-time databases work with the cloud functions or the serverless. So as you saw in your database, there's different nodes and different references. Basically, there's uh, what Firebase gives you. They have what they call Firebase real-time triggers. So when a change occurs, when new data comes into your database or you delete something, that fires off an event and then your function is invoked. So you can actually create functions that listen to these uh, event changes and that's very helpful. So say new data comes in, a user signs in or a user creates uh, a new post, you can have a function that sanitizes that information or a function that looks at that and, and passes that data on to a, a function that's a proxy actually, that passed that data on somewhere else. Um, and these are the types of uh, event handlers that you can listen for on write. On write is basically any, any event. So if something has been created, if there's been any data deleted or any data updates, you just use on write. But if you wanna get more specific, you can use the on create, which is specifically for new data. Uh, 
on update, which is for any data updates, and on delete. And uh, when you call these, these event handlers, it actually passes you the object that's been affected, which is very nice to see. Uh, cloud storage triggers also, so if you have a storage bucket, so for me, I have music. If I upload a new song, I can receive that. Uh, my cloud function will actually download the song into the function instance, and then I can play around with the metadata. I can convert pictures into thumbnails and then re-upload back into the storage. I think that's pretty helpful. Uh, yeah, so I, I did a little demo of a very simple application. Uh, I'll just pull that up. And I'll pull up my database. Here it is. Okay. I'll just refresh this. So basically what's happening here is um, I have these two cloud functions over here. Uh, the, uh, the, can everyone see that? Okay. So basically, I have one function that receives the message that I've posted into the chat, but that message goes into the buffer, into the buffer record, and then uh, it looks at that data, and then it, it, pull, uh, it sanitizes it and then pushes it into the actual message buff bucket where everyone else can see it. So, as you can see, one second, I have the on request, it, re it, re it receives a request object here, and then within that request object over here, I have the username, I have the message and the timestamp, and then right over here, I'm ac this is how I'm uh, accessing Firebase. I'm accessing Firebase uh, database through the admin module, and I let it know, uh, this refs buffer, I let it know which node that I want. If you remember right here, there's the messages reference that I'm looking at. Okay, and uh, it, pushes, it pushes that new message into that buffering node. And then once, uh, this is a second, this is a second cloud function, but this one is different because the first one is a HTTP module. It's a HTTP uh, function. I've invoked this function through an HTTP post. The second one is being invoked from the database. Something has changed in the database because here I've posted a new message into the database and then it's listening, it's listening at that node and then it receives that data object over here. If you can see. And then I go ahead and I push I push that new message into the messages bucket. So I'll just go ahead and play around with that uh, application and you'll see how that works. So I'll just quickly sign in with my name. There you go. So you saw it, it comes into the buffer it gets sanitized and then it gets pushed into the messages. It's pretty neat. And um, I was gonna get everyone to access it in chat, but the URL over here is kinda, it's kinda long for those who wanna access it on their phones. So yeah, there you go. It's very neat, it's very nice uh, and easy to use. Um, how I've used it on a macro level is I, for my website, I don't have a server. I've just deployed my website to, uh, I'll just open it up actually. I've just deployed it to Firebase and um, I've just set up cloud functions to handle the different types of, sorry. <laughs> there you go. So this is my, my website. Basically it's a music website for African music. It's like uh, Spotify, but for Africa. So, there you go. Go in here, this is what it looks like. All the music is stored in Google Cloud. Uh, all this stuff that you're seeing here, there's a real-time database, a very big real-time database. Uh, we handle our authentication using those cloud functions. So there's a, we make a HTTP post to a cloud function that's a proxy, and then that then sends it to the sends it to the login, to the validation, and uh, your users are able to log in. Uh, 
We also have an artist platform. By the way, this is not marketing. I'm just... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all, yeah. Uh, this is the artist platform where artists can manage their music. Again, the sign-in that we just did is, is also done using uh, cloud functions. And all these numbers that are showing up here are calculated using cloud functions. So every week, we use what is called cloud PubSub. I believe uh, Matt mentioned that a little bit. Every week, I have a cloud function that runs every seven days, goes into every artist's bucket and counts uh, how many songs did you get a day, how many people listen to it, and it, the data is ready for there. Um, and we also calculate how much they've earned every day. It's very, it's, it's really, it's really neat and, and helpful, I believe. Um, so yeah, even, uh, where is it? Here you can upload pictures, you can change pictures, all this is using Firebase. I've done all of it on Firebase. So you can really build large applications. I also have a mobile application, uh, an Android application, that's also built on Firebase using the same code. I don't have three different code bases. As you can see, these are two applications on one. So yeah, I hope this was helpful. I'm pretty new into development. So something like Firebase really helped me to get up and running I, it's a one-man team. I don't have any. I don't have any people who've helped me. This, I would say, it's a pretty full-stack application. Yeah. So, yeah. I hope that will be helpful to someone. And uh, if you have any other questions, uh, yeah, I'll be happy to take them. John, John on stage as well. Just a question about the a question about the cost for Firebase. Um, how much does it cost? Is it free? Is it, how does it work? Sorry, the cost. Cost. Oh. Yeah, uh, so far, I'm still in development. I haven't paid anything <laughs> thus far. <laughs> thus far. Um, this is actually, I forgot to show this slide. Let me just put that up. So they have a free plan where you have 125,000 invocations per function, and that's free. You also have, uh, these are the different ways that they can charge you, actually. So. You can be charged by the number of invocations that you have and then they'll cut you off. Or you can be charged by the number of gigabytes that you're processing every second. So that's the gigabytes per second. You also have uh, CPU seconds that you're using. You can also be charged using that. So I'm on the pay-as-you-go plan. So yeah, as you can see over there, um, it, it does auto scale. You don't have to worry about migrating it. If you wake up overnight and a million people are using a service, it auto scales up. But uh, I have heard some horror stories about, yeah, about people getting overcharged. So just always make sure that you are setting your timeouts on your functions. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I kind of have two questions. Uh, Firebase is awesome, by the way, and that's. Really impressive what you've done yeah, for a year and a half, so good on you. Um, maybe you've run across this as well. Debugging uh, serverless can be very difficult with Firebase Cloud functions, um, especially if you're doing any kind of data sanitizing or transforming, yeah. um, figuring out, like relating a problem back to the particular function that you're doing. I wonder if you've had any uh, techniques that you've developed for that. Uh, my other question, maybe it's related, is um, why are you using a pub sub when uh, rather than just using like the on write for for um, you know the calculations that you need to do? Okay, uh, I'll answer the first one. Uh, debugging is a pain. It's it's to this point. Uh, I have a friend over there. 
Balaji, he's experienced the same pain with me when we're trying to debug AWS. I, th it's something that they need to improve, but uh, console logging, seeing what data you're receiving, where the errors are carrying, um, that's, it's not, it's not a scalable way of doing things, but for now, the console log is pretty much all you have. If something goes wrong in there, um, I was just going to say, um, there's a logging service provided by mm -hmm. Google that you can access the same way as the other connected services. So I've tried it. I've had like some yeah. success with it. So it seems a little bit slow, and I don't always know if it's like working the way that I think <laughs> it it should be working. But it might be worth taking a look at. Sometimes I, I actually it, in the beginning I was using the Firebase console to deploy everything, but. Every now and then I find myself in the Google Cloud console, deploying directly from there, editing my code. It's a little bit faster, but yeah, the logging of the logging is a little bit difficult. It's very hard to debug on, for me at least, on, on Google Cloud. Um, the, the last question, I forgot. So every month, every month I have to make sure that that data is accurate. So if someone wants to come in and check, and something might get deleted, or I just need to make sure that it's it's correct. So every every week I need to ensure that because when you have, if it becomes something big, if I have a hundred thousand people, I can't just depend on maybe someone deleted a piece of information. So I need that information always being logged. To the yeah. I initially wanted to ask about monitoring, but you've just answered that before. Um, so another thing that I wanted to ask, uh, I forgot it now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions or might goes, okay. How do you trigger from, if, 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 an, if an event happens in your bucket, how do you trigger your functions to pick that up? Do you have a listening API or how does that work? Using if Firebase. So if something is pushed into a storage bucket? Yes. So, so sorry, go ahead. Um, Google Cloud also has, sorry, not Google Cloud, Firebase. You have to set those event handlers on, on this part right here. So on create is one of the events that you can use. When something comes into the bucket, it, it, it immediately sends off a, a trigger and then your function is woken and it does what it needs to do. Um, they have a, an API that is so similar to this. Yeah. Yeah, Firebase is very simple. You can, if you can get your application up and running in a week, you know, and if you're someone who's experienced, you can really do it in a week. Yeah, they also have uh, support for, for analytics and way more machine learning. I haven't gone that far. Hopefully, we'll do it in the future, but um, yeah. Okay, now I remember it. <laughs> um, basically, since you were saying uh, you've built quite a lot of code over time, how do you organize that, or do you use any infrastructure as code type of Terraform scripts in order to, to replicate your setups when you're doing a new deployment? And how do you sort of organize all of your different functions and sort of perhaps monitor the way that like functions calling functions calling functions in order to sort of like have some architectural overview of what the structure of your overall system architecture is? Um, that's, that's where I'm getting to now. In the beginning, you can, I'm sure you can understand, I was just worried about getting this product out there. I was so frustrated. Like it took me two years to get to the point where I said, okay, let me learn how to code. But in those days, I was just writing long lines of code. There was no structure whatsoever. Um, halfway through, I was like, okay, this is, I don't even know what that part of code is. That's when I had to start looking into 
structurizing components. Even with the cloud functions, I have like 15 cloud functions deployed for this specific project, and that also starts to get messy. So I'm looking into developing some sort of system for that. It's, it's something that I'm definitely looking into, having some proxy where all the requests are sent to and then they're mapped to the different functions. That's something that I'm looking into, but yeah, always improving. Yeah. Um, I have two questions. First, great job, it looks nice. Thank you. Um, how long did it take you to build your platform? Right, because you, you're not a developer, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to learn everything from scratch. And also, in terms of performance, um, what did you get? Did you, do you have any numbers? Like, let's say if your artists, they need to upload files, for instance, how, how do your function, how long do your function take to process the, the upload, for instance? Or I is it something that you yeah. have in your application? Yeah, uploading, Average size for a song is five megabytes. That usually takes a couple of seconds. It's very fast, it's extremely fast. What I'm currently testing is how that'll work in Africa because the data access is a little bit slow over there. We're currently testing that. I was using imp uh, the internet access that was at my, at my home, but that's pretty fast. The majority of people don't have that kind of internet access. In, um, in terms of how long it took me to develop the application, the web, the website, I built that this year. Uh, I took some time off work, and it took me about two months, two months to build that. Um, what took me the longest was the uh, mobile application. Dealing with the native stuff was extremely hard, and testing it, testing it was, was hard, because I actually built it using uh, this framework called Cordova. Yeah. Yeah, I use Cordova. I wanted. To, I should have used Ionic. Would have been simpler, but it's pure JavaScript. I built. It was. I just grabbed some of the code from the app, put it in here, just made it responsive for the web. Yeah. So it's just pure JavaScript. There's no. The only framework is Cordova and jQuery. Yeah. So and it's pretty fast. Like downloading on mobile, you can just download your entire library, hundred songs. That'll be done in a couple minutes. With two minutes, two, three minutes. Yeah, it's pretty fast. That's cool. So, so big, uh, well, okay. I was just going to say, as Firebase as a database, does it have any capabilities of uh, full text search if you wanted in your application to be able to search? Now in your case, you said you can download the whole library in a few seconds. So, I'm assuming filtering and searching you might just do in memory in JavaScript and it would be lightning fast. But if, it, if you were searching something with millions of records, would you have to put something else like an Elasticsearch in front of your Firebase? So what they recommend doing is indexing. If you know the different references, so for example, uh, most the most popular would be uh, the usernames uh, when they log in, when users log in, uh, artist names when people are searching, the song names. You can index those records so that when people reference that, they don't have to do a deep search into a billion records. They just go in, Google just goes into that uh, array of indexes and just, I don't know how to explain it, but it's, it's extremely fast. If you're familiar yeah. with indexing, yeah, it's pretty fast, yeah. So big applause. Algolia is also another one that you can yeah. use, yeah. And if you go back to the uh, YouTube list, we had to talk about Algolia, you can include it as well. Yeah. Big applause for Kurt, that's amazing. <laughs> So we'll have, we'll have both presenters on the stage now to answer additional questions, and then around 8 o'clock, we're going to have half an hour mingling or before if you run out of questions. So. Okay, so, so for these questions, uh, we have a few minutes left. There's a little bit of overlap, in my opinion, between uh, Cloud Functions and Firebase. So what we could do is answer questions about like which tool you might use for for the job and like what their advantages are. Uh, is there any other questions? Yeah. So do you see uh, progressing from Firebase into a full GCP? Is that something you're interested in? 
Yep. Um, I use GCP. I use a little bit of GCP. But for now, no. Yeah, for, n for now it's doing the job, I'd say. Um, regarding access controls, uh, Firebase gives you really nice features, like JSON-based features for controlling access. Um, yeah. I'm just wondering, uh, like, do you use any tools for versioning that stuff, like uh, Bolt or anything like that? I don't use any. I don't use any. No. Uh, uh, it's a good tool. Yeah. <laughs> you should check it out. Uh, Bolt allows you to do, ver like you know how you can set up your access controls like through the dashboard, yeah. just uh, accessing the JSON directly. Bolt provides you with like a language, like a pseudo language for generating those access controls. It will generate um, that file for you and you can okay. use that for versioning your, your access control security. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. It, check it could be check good. It it's called Bolt. Bolt. Yeah. Who's next? Okay. I was just talking about Stack Driver as a. I think Stack Driver is pretty much integrated into uh, Firebase also because. So, yeah, I think it can be. St uh, if you don't mind, I'll actually take a minute to describe Stackdriver and how I use it to, to solve these problems. So um, the thing to keep in mind is that Firebase is where you work at a high level. So it's designed to help people like him create apps very quickly, right? And so uh, under the hood, there's still GCP services that are being provisioned. And uh, it's basically cloud functions to do a lot of that work. So Stackdriver is this part of the Google Cloud where you, it uh, amalgamates the logs of every single service you've deployed. And that becomes crucial for debugging function problems because now you've got maybe 100 or 200 cloud functions that you've deployed, whether it's through Firebase or through the G Cloud tool like I did. And uh, you can filter by errors and you can see, and as long as you're, you're logging properly, console.info versus console.error, stuff like that, you can then see only the errors that occurred across your whole uh, system. And that's where you can use Stackdriver to look for which functions had problems, where, where was the problem. Um, I remember, uh, I think two years ago, I was working with a client, and by default, the, um, everyone can have access to the data on Firebase. Is this something that's still current, uh, and do you have to change it? I mean, is this uh, something? They have security rules that, so for example, you saw those the database and those different nodes, you can actually, uh, Puts access. You can have access controls on what nodes people have access to, or just completely shut it down. Though the admin, which is the cloud function, uh, I think you can access. You can access completely. the The rules don't work on that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But how do you fix it then? Yeah. shouldn't actually get past your access control layer. Uh, there's not really another way of, of trigger. Like Firebase is a little bit different from the Google Cloud um, uh, function itself. It's providing that, that access layer that will only get triggered by the database action. So yeah, you have to be a user who's authenticated to be able to interact with, uh, with the database. And you can, only, you can set read, read access only on those. Uh, that's why having a proxy and creating session tools, se session um, session tokens can be effective as well. That's what I'm trying to build into it now. Instead of just having direct access to each cloud function. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. And just to expand on that briefly, um, during my presentation where I where I deployed a function, uh, somebody asked me about security, and I mentioned that you'd have to create that code yourself to look at the token. So the functions that you created used the Firebase NPM libraries. And that's a way of doing that. So when you're ready to move to a higher level, 
you can use some libraries and add those to your function to look at the token and decide whether or not to you know, delete the file. So I, I'm just curious, uh, besides the Firebase, are there any other events that can trigger uh, Google Functions on Google Platform? So that's one question. The other question is, is there an orchestration mechanism for Google Functions, something similar to Step Functions? Workflows. Uh, just to clarify, the question was, are there any uh, other Firebase events that you could use to trigger functions? Com Gotcha. So um, based on me exploring AWS and Google, because I'm often curious to compare them, I have not found an equivalent to step functions on Google Cloud. It could just be because I'm new, and I might have to check it out more. Uh, as for the Firebase events, I'm going to pass the mic. Uh, for, the, for the database ones, those are the ones that they have currently. Uh, those are also the same for Firestore. I didn't go into Firestore, but it's, it's just a transactional database, and they have the same um, events that you can call. For events, yeah. Gotcha. Um, I didn't have any. I didn't have time to talk about this in my slides. But another huge difference I saw between AWS and Google Cloud is how they do PubSub. AWS has notification service, queue service, something called CloudWatch events. I haven't played around with it yet. Google Cloud has just PubSub. So it's this really simple system where you can pass a message from a topic to any subscription subscribing to it. That means that you actually get these kind of Lego building blocks where you can put together whatever you want. Uh, you've got the events that I spoke about, HTTP triggers, and then whatever you manually put in the topic. You've got the Firebase events and you can also keep in mind that, that web hooks exist. So you might have a service somewhere else. Uh, I actually have a tutorial on my blog, a little plug here, where I set up uh, Heroku Postgres connected to Lambda. And in order to keep the credentials fresh, I have a Heroku web hook, which sends a post request to any URL I tell it to. And that URL is a function that I deployed. So that's, and if your function uh, s is, is programmed to send a PubSub message, you've now created a link into the system, right? So you can technically have anything that happens on the internet be an event for a Google Cloud function. Any other questions? We're almost time to mingle. And any other questions? No. So, so big hand to the community members like. <laughs> it's, it's really not easy to come on the stage talk for the to first time, but I want you here. It doesn't have to be Google Cloud. It doesn't have to be Amazon. Like uh, a any serverless mindset is allowed as long as there is not much pitching. And we're always looking for the sponsors for pizza. So thank you. So, so let's do the draw. Who does not have ticket for the Manning free giveaway? There were some people that came late. Anybody doesn't have a ticket? OK. Anybody? You don't have a ticket. So it doesn't cost you anything. It's just a free Romanian gift. Uh, any anybody else? Anybody else? <laughs> okay, so let's see. <laughs> yes, and then we're going to have a. So I think let's do two. Uh, there is a plenty of people, so I can bribe you to come back again. So <laughs> each of you draw one. So we have two winners. Oops, 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 oops. And then I'm blind, so you pick one and read, and then not, not yours. <laughs> <laughs> OK, read the left one. Uh, 690-3960. Ticket ending in 960. 
Perfect. Uh, thank you. You're the one who uh, showed me a uh, Google Firebase group. Thank you so much. <laughs> Left hand. Uh, 6903949. Perfect. Thank you so much. So connect with me on LinkedIn uh, because I, I cannot chase you. It's really hard to find you after. So. So thank you for coming. Uh, we're going to spend. We have to be out of this place at 8:30. So thank you, my planet, again, and and please stay here and chat with the guys. No recording.